Now today we're wrapping up our series we've been in this summer called The Heart of a Champion. Now how many of you know some of the most inspiring stories during the Olympics came from people that actually uh, didn't win their race? They didn't win any medal at all. In fact, uh, you're probably familiar with this story in the women's um, 5,000 meter uh, race. Let's go ahead and roll this little clip here. Good sportsmanship takes the spotlight during the women's 5,000 meter race at this year's Olympics. Early on in the second heat of the race, which took place August 16th, New Zealand runner Nikki Hamblin tripped and fell on the track. Abby Diagostino from Team USA was right behind Hamblin, causing her to stumble and fall as well. But when Diagostino got back up and saw that Hamblin was still struggling, she helped her get back on her feet and told Hamblin, this is the Olympic Games. We have to finish this. As the race continued, it was clear that Diagostino's knee had been injured, causing her to struggle. She fell down again, and this time, Hamblin stayed with Diagostino until she was okay to keep running. Both women finished the race and embraced after crossing the finish line. Despite their tumbles, Diagostino and Hamblin will be allowed to advance to the semifinals. For Newsbeat Social, I'm Chad Carter. That was a good story, huh? You know, these women, they had every excuse to, uh, to quit the race. And uh, they have a lot in common with kind of the unsung hero we've been looking at all summer long, a guy by the name of Jabez. Let me hear you say Jabez. This is a guy that probably had about every excuse to hang it up, but he chose not to. He didn't want to just simply deal with the hand that life had dealt him. He wanted to reach for God's best, God's purposes. He refused to just simply kind of roll over and die here. In fact, here's our last time. I want us to read this passage together. There's several underlines. And if you'll notice, all through this summer... Each of these underlines became a theme for that particular week's message. Let's go ahead and take a look at it together. Jabez was more honorable. Let me hear you say more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. And keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. God granted his request. Now, you know, when you read this prayer, at each of these points, it doesn't seem that earth shattering. And yet at each point, it is a desperate plea, a desperate request for the miraculous to bust loose in his life. And so, do you have your outline with you this morning? If you don't, grab it. It's in your bulletin. And you're going to get all these these sermons kind of tied together in a brief one-session sermon right here. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, if you're going to get them all in one sermon, why did I come all summer long? Great question. Now, I want to encourage you because obviously when you're dedicating an entire teaching time to that particular session, you're able to expand on it and expound on it a whole, a whole lot more. So you're kind of getting just the, the highlights of what we talked about. We're talking about what have we learned? What did we learn this summer from Jabez? And the first thing that we learned from him is you want to reach for the honorable life. Let me hear you say honorable life. Now, did you got... How many of you heard the story of these two um, women runners that went down and they helped each other finish the race? You guys remember that one? Now, does anybody know who actually won the 5,000-meter women's race? Does anybody remember that? And yet what you do remember is the people who came in last place. We remember the people that came in last place. Because they had to face their limitations. They had to reach deep. They had to kind of find that heart of a champion and keep going when they were facing that adversity. So that kind of leaves us wondering, why was Jabez more honorable than his brothers? And I think what we discovered was that this was a man who had limitations. We don't know why his mother named him Pain. We don't know that. Maybe he was abandoned at birth. Maybe he was born with a birth 
defect. We, maybe he was, there was something unusually painful at his birth. We don't know why she named him that, but there was something about this person's life that kind of set him on a trajectory of a life marked with pain. And yet he chose to not just simply accept that. He reached deep. He contended for more. And how many of you know there's something admirable about that? There's something that kind of captures your heart. And in his case, would cause heaven to sit up, take notice, and applaud. And I want to encourage you. What do you say? Maybe you've experienced a lot of pain in your life. Anybody had a broken relationship? Anybody? How many of you have had a broken life? How many of you have struggled with addictions? How many of you have had, uh, you know, kind of a mess, messed up time in your life? Anybody? Then guess what? Yeah, just keep, you know, both hands, both feet. Then what do you say? You do what Jabez did. Rather than to bemoan your miserable life. What do you say you cry out for God? And you know, herein lies the blessing of pain. And I said this on first week, on the first week of this series. This, herein lies the blessing of pain. Because when you're in pain, what do you do? You look for something to deal with the pain. Now, the tragedy is, uh, you know, people look for alcohol, they look for drugs, they look for me- other messed up people, thinking somehow they're going to make their life better. Have you found out that doesn't work one bit? And what, you know, so pain drives you to look for an answer. And now that you've figured out none of those answers are working for you, let it do what it did for Jabez. Let it drive you to call out and cry out for God. That's a more honorable thing. Rather than just settle for your miserable life, contend for what God has for you. Amen? And what did we learn for him? Cry out for the blessing of God. Cry out for his blessing. And what does it mean? What is, a, what is the biblical blessing? What does that mean? Crying out for supernatural favor. Let me hear you say supernatural favor. What does that mean? That simply means crying out for what only God can give. Now, I love the fact that this was an indiscretionary prayer. He didn't cry out for God, Oh, God, that you would give me a Mercedes. Oh, God, that you would give me a better paying job. Oh, God. He didn't put out what the request was. It was indiscretionary. Oh, God, that you would bless me. In other words, he left it all up to God. How many of you know God knows a whole lot better than you do about what you need in your life? Is that true? Oh, God, that you would bless me. His focus was on wanting nothing more and nothing less than what God wanted. God, my life's been a big, fat, painful mess, and I want to exchange my broken life for your life. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. You know, we talked about that first week, that so often when a blessing comes, what do we want to do with it? We want to hoard it. We want to hang on to it. I may never see another one. There may never be another blessing to come, so I better hold on to this one with all I got. And the Lord says, what do you say? You you learn to hold on to my blessings I bring your way with an open hand. Because how can I possibly bring the next one when you're busy hoarding the last one? And you know, the Lord had challenged me when he put the question to me. He says, you're going to be a freeway or are you going to be a cul-de-sac? Are you going to be a river or are you going to be a pond? We have been called to be a conduit of God's blessing. And you know, the moment we hang on to his blessing with a clenched fist rather than an open hand, we actually end up shutting off the flow of God's blessing. How many of you as parents, you really do want to bless your kids? You want to bless them. Can I just tell you that your Heavenly Father, He wants to bless you? And what do you say we do what Jabez did? Do not let, do not let the pain and the circumstances that you face, that you've encountered in your life, to somehow warp your view 
of who God is. Regardless of what you've been through, he loves you, he's crazy about you, God wants to bless you. Amen? So then the next thing we talked about was this next aspect of his prayer, where he said, enlarge my territory. What does that mean, that you would enlarge my territory? In essence, what he's doing here, he's crying out, God, I want my life to count. I want it to count. Enlarge my influence. Enlarge my ministry. And we talked about how a lot of us say, I don't want to pray that. I'm already so busy. I don't want to pray, God, give me more. And then I told you this story of how we had this dirt pile at, out at the cabin. And I'm out there shoveling with, my, uh, with a spade and a wheelbarrow trying to relocate this dirt pile. And thinking, man, this is going to be a lot of work. And about that time, my father-in-law comes around the corner with a bulldozer. Same pile, same work, done far more effectively. And in essence, when you're crying out, God, would you enlarge my territory? What you're praying is, God, I'm, th- this isn't working real well. I want to exchange my spade for your, for, for your bulldozer. I want to exchange my limited resources for your limitless resources. I want to move beyond my power and my capabilities and tap into what you can do. How many of you know when you've got God engaged in the equation, you're able to operate far more effectively and get far greater results? Amen? Isn't that something we want? Isn't that something that we want? You know, no parent gets upset when their kid asks, Hey, Dad, can I help you? How can I help you? Your kids ever ask that? Mine either. (laughs) But in essence, when you ask the Lord, Lord, would you enlarge my territory? What you're saying is, God, I I want to help you more. I want to do what I can for you. You know, there's needs that are all around this world. And really all we need is the compassion and the eyes to see what's going on. God is far more interested in your willingness to bring what you have to the table than how skilled or gifted or talented you are. Amen? So the next thing we talked about was this third element of his prayer. Oh, God, that you would bless me, that your hand, that, that, that you would enlarge my territory. And then what was his next thing? That your hand would be with me. Let me hear you say that, that your hand would be with me. Now, there's a huge difference between pushing your car everywhere and getting into your car and turning the key and tapping into all the horsepower under the hood. When you're crying out, God, that your hand would be with me, that your hand would be upon me, what you're saying is, God, I've been busy trying to push my car, kind of push my life along, and it's exhausting. It's wearing me out. God, I want to tap in to your power, to the resources of the kingdom of God. Now, how many of you know that your life, your ministry, everything changes when it's operating under the power of God? Amen? So, you ever find yourself feeling overwhelmed? Anybody? You ever feel like, I can't do this? You are a prime candidate for a close encounter of the holy kind. Amen? You are a prime candidate for an encounter with the power of God. Because when you're in that place, it drives you to cry out. When you're not feeling that pressure, when you're not feeling overwhelmed, when you're not feeling, uh, gee, I can't handle this, then are you going to cry out for help? Probably not. And so it's actually a really good place to be. In 1 Peter, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under, the, under God's mighty hand. Let me hear you say that. God's mighty hand, that he will lift you up in due time. God's hand will open doors no man can shut, will close doors that no man can open. As you grasp the Father's hand, he will lead you into, his, into your destiny. Acts says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will what? Be my be my witnesses. To be his witness is not that just you know, not so you can just tell people Bible stories. So you can tell them about Noah and the ark, and you can tell them how God parted the Red Sea. When he says, "You will be my witness," 
your life becomes a story of the power of God. This is where I was, and this is what God did in my life. You will be a witness. You will be able to testify of what his power can do. His life on your, uh, his hand on your life will move you into spirit-enabled exploits. Do you remember when I used uh, those words together? Let me hear you say spirit-enabled exploits. Ephesians says this, do not get drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is like plugging your cell phone in. If you don't, if you don't plug it in, eventually what's going to happen? It's going to die. And if you're not plugging into God, taking those moments and, and raising your heart, raising your life and saying, God, fill me with your Spirit, guess what you're going to do? You're going to be depleted. You will not have the emotional energy to face the things that you face in life. Being spirit-filled individuals gives you what's necessary to live the life God has called you to live. Can everybody say amen to that? Stacy talked about this. Keep me from harm that I will be free from pain. Let me hear you say free from pain. Have you ever heard this saying, hurt people, hurt people? You ever found that to be true? So when you've you've been hurt, which we all have, when you've experienced uh, pain in your life, that pain can be um, physical. Uh, uh, Arguably, the greatest pain we face in our life comes from relationships. Those hurt far more than the physical pain that we experience. Is that true? Okay. So when you've experienced pain, there's two dangers. One is you carry the pain, you internalize it, and so much of the sickness and disease that people have comes from internalized hurt that begins to break down your body. Did you know that? Another danger is this is that you take your hurt, you internalize it, but then you turn and you begin to express it to other people. So you've been hurt from somebody over here, now you're taking it, you're expressing it on your mate, on your kids, on people you care about. The people that didn't hurt you end up kind of getting the brunt of your pain that you haven't dealt with properly. Anybody ever done that one? Okay. That's a tough one to admit, isn't it? (laughs) But then Jabez prays his prayer. And in essence, this here's what he says. This is what his prayer is. He says, God, I've had pain in my life. My name is Jabez, for Pete's sake. It means pain. My entire life has been marked by pain. And God, today I make a choice. Rather than to hang on to my pain, I'm giving it to you. That I might be free from pain so that I may not cause pain. You know, when you read that, when you read that prayer, the translation is, could be that I would be free from pain, but it could also mean that I may not cause pain. How many of you know both of those are really important things to deal with? Because if you've internalized, you've you've held on to your hurt, you've held on to your pain, both of those actually end up happening. You will experience pain because you've continued to hang on to it, and you will cause pain because hurt people hurt people. And so Jabez cries out. He says, God, I'm giving my hurt to you. I'm giving my pain. We don't know what it was. But in this prayer, he's saying, God, I'm giving it to you so that I would be free from pain, that I may not cause pain. How many of you want success in your relationships? You want them to work. You want them to thrive. This is a prayer we need to learn to pray, where we keep bringing it and giving it to the Lord. And, you know, the last thing is this. I love this. It says, God granted his request. Let me hear you say that. God granted his request. 
Now, before I jump there, let me back up because I did have a verse I wanted to share with you, and it's John 10.10. 10. You guys ready? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what's, what is one way the enemy does this? The way he will steal, kill, and destroy. Keeping you stuck in your pain. The issue is not whether or not you've experienced pain. Hello, you're a, you're a human being. Welcome to the human race. There's pain. That's not the issue that's there. The issue is what will you do with it? And the way the enemy wins at this is by you doing this with your pain. Hanging on to it. Because it destroys you and it will eventually destroy your relationships. So how do you experience that life abundant that Jesus promised? By doing what Jabez said. Give it to the Lord. Give your hurt to the pain. Give your hurt and pain to the Lord. Confess it to him. Hand it over to him. It says God granted his request. You know, one of the things we learn from Jabez is this, that God seems to favor those who ask. What did James say? You do not have because you do not ask God. You know, God holds nothing back from those that want nothing less than what God wants. Matthew 7 said this, ask and what? It will be given to you. What was the first word? Ask. Let me hear you say ask. Ask. You know, part of breaking into the larger life that God has for you is knowing that the goodness of God that we sing about, that we talk about, is not just some kind of generic, platonic um, goodness that's out there for the world. It's for you. I told the story about the stone-hearted nun that had the dream of Jesus in a tux and tail and a top hat who reached out and asked for a dance and pulled her close and whispered, I am crazy about you. It changed her countenance. It changed her life. And for so many of us, we have this idea that God is cold. God is hard. We've taken a dysfunctional parent. We've stuck it on the face of God. And we keep God pushed away because these authority figures hurt us. But I challenge you, if you'll take a risk just for a moment and you'll let him pull in close and you'll listen, he'll tell you things like, I love you. I'm crazy about you. I am mad about you. I even like you. I even like you. And then we try to argue with the Lord. But Lord, if you only knew what a mess I was. And he goes, I do. And I still like you. Now, granted, I love you too much to leave you where you are, but I'm willing to take you right where you are and move forward in the kind of relationship where real transformation takes place. How can you not walk with that kind of God? Amen? He loves you. He's crazy about you. You know, God wants your journey of faith to be onward and upward. We talked about that. That this is not meant to be a one-time deal where God blesses you, he enlarges your territory, he fills you with the Holy Spirit, and you get comfortable there. And then you just stay there. But it's onward, it's upward. God, that you would bless me. And he does. God, that you would enlarge my territory. And he does. He gives you greater influence, maybe, maybe greater responsibility. You feel stretched. That leads you to cry out, oh God, I need your spirit. And so he fills you, and you learn to operate at that level. And then again, you cry out, God, that you would bless me. God, that you would enlarge my territory. God, that you would fill me, that your hand would be upon me. I was watching our breakfast ministry today, and I think about where it's come from. I mean, this morning, it was pancakes, eggs, ham, cantaloupe, uh, grapefruit, bananas, it's like, oh my goodness, it goes on and on and on. And do you remember when it first started out, we're thinking, man, if we're going to be doing pretty good here if we can just get a bowl of cereal out there. And what's happened? Oh, Lord, that you would bless us. Oh, Lord, that you would enlarge our territory. And he says, okay. And then, oh, man, I'm feeling stretched. Oh, God, we need more of your spirit. And he does. 
And then here's what's happening. There's an enlargement that's happening. You know what the Bible says? He says, those who give to the poor lend to the Lord. In theory, when you loan to somebody, what happens? You get it back. Now, when the bank loans to you, what do they get back? They get more than they loan to you. How many of you think God is quite capable of doing better than the bank? Those who give to the poor lend to the Lord. You know what he spoke to me this morning? He says, I'm not going to wait to pay you back either. This isn't, I'll pay you back in heaven. Yeah, he will. But I believe this church is right on the cusp, right on the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right things. And God's saying, I like it. I'm going to bless it. Amen. Hallelujah. If you don't like a ministry that deals working with the poor, then you probably wouldn't have liked Jesus being in your Sunday school class. He had no place to lay his head. And when he called his disciples, he told them straight up, I don't know where we're sleeping tonight. You know, there's two things that I know that get in the way of God's blessing. One is not asking. We're not all comfortable with doing that. And what happens is if you're not convinced of the goodness of God, that he loves you, that he's crazy about you, then you're going to be not very comfortable taking your request and crying out for his blessing. You're not going to be comfortable doing that. I want you to get a real vision of the gracious, loving, kind, heavenly father we have. Okay? You got to get that right vision. And then the second thing, here's the second thing that gets in the way of the flow of his blessing is sin. God simply does not bless sin. How many of you have found that to be true? Okay. So you can't be saying, oh, God, that you would bless me while you're continuing your chronic lifestyle of sin. At some point, we need to repent, turn away, and point the direction of our lives towards the Lord. Right? We got to do that. We got to get in the right direction. Now, we shared this verse, and I've shared this one many times over the years. And it will be shared many times in the future. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, once you've, uh, it only takes a moment to reconnect with the Lord. And you know, once you've experienced his blessing and sin creeps in, you're going to begin to develop a disdain for sin. How many of you in the past, you loved sin? You loved your sinful lifestyle. You had a real taste for it, right? And what happens now when you've said yes to Christ and he's blessed you and you're walking with him and you experience God's goodness, God's favor, God's kindness, and all of a sudden sin creeps in and you stumble, guess what begins to happen? It's like, I didn't like that. I don't even feel good about that. And it takes less time for you to be grieved about your sin, less time for you to confess it to the Lord, and you start to develop longer spells between your sin. That's how you know you're on the right track. It's not that you never sin again. It's that, gee, I'm not liking it anymore. And I'm starting to get longer gaps between my sin. And when I do sin, I grieve about it. I confess it to the Lord. It takes me less time to get up lift my chin, and get marching forward again. Amen? You want that kind of life? I like this. The more I'm at my limits, the more I discover the limitless God. I like that. The more I'm at my limits, the more I discover the limitless God. That's kind of where Jabez was. Lord, bless me. Enlarge my territory. Oh, man. I'm at my limits. I'm in over my head. I'm handling all I can. Boom. We discover the limitless God. He brings the resources of heaven. He enables me to do what's before me. And then we cry out again. He takes us to the next level. Amen. Don't get too comfortable where you're at. God is moving us forward, upward, marching ahead. Amen.